Any story worth telling needs heroes. But for over a thousand years, art didn't have any heroes. Or if it did, their names have vanished into oblivion. Suddenly, out of nowhere, came a man who would change all that. Legend has it he was just a humble shepherd. And his name was Giotto. The shepherd boy spotted drawing a perfect sheep by a passing artist, whisked away to fame and fortune. Ah, but that's the legend. What we do know for sure is that Giotto was suddenly the most famous artist in Italy. And he was employed by the infamous moneylenders, the Scorvegni family, who built the Arena Chapel in Padua to atone for their sins. People flocked here to see Giotto's own miracle, the drama of the Christian stories, painted as never before. It's as if up to now people had had radio. Then Giotto gives them television. People were bowled over. They came in here and walked around looking at all these great human dramatic stories. There was the kiss, warm, tender. And there was violence, cold human cruelty. There's a young couple getting married. There's birth. There's a party. And it was all absolutely real. Just look at the body language here. You don't need to know the Christian story to know what Giotto is painting. He's painting that deep, passionate sorrow we feel when somebody we love is dead. There's nothing kind of weepy waily about here. It's strong, overwhelming grief, and everybody's showing it in a different way. The two men at the end stiff up a lip and the young man who just can't believe in death. And central, of course, there's Mary, the one who always grieves most, the mother, holding him with those limp, defeated hands and just looking at him without a tear. And that carries us, of course, onto the angels, that, that extraordinary invention of Giotto's fizzing away there in the sky, little fireballs of energy and, and passion and anguish. I can almost hear eerie little bat squeaks coming from them as they tear their clothes and tear their hair and make faces. And this is particularly strange because Jota wasn't the kind of man who really understood angels. What he understood was the human, making religion seem part of our world, solid and tender and real. But angels, he'd never seen an angel. And when it came to painting them, this is how he usually behaved. Look, the best he can do are two podgy human beings with wings on them. And because they're just sitting there doing nothing, he really can't get up much interest in them. What interests him is the story, as always, the story and what's happening. Here are all the soldiers those great male supine, lost in sleep, missing it all. And in the middle, this marvelous Mary Magdalene, that wonderful profile, lost in that eternal gesture of longing. And she's longing for Christ, and he is saying to her, he is leaving. He's looking at her, but his body is already carrying him out of this picture. He is saying to her, Giotto was lucky to be born at a time when it was the Italian cities that were setting the pace in medieval Europe. And they enjoyed nothing better than showing off to one another on the battlefield, or less dangerously, with colorful pageants, which can still be seen today. Siena had just won an unexpected victory over its more powerful rival, Florence. 
And what better way to celebrate than by ordering a great painting from the city's champion artist? If Florence had Giotto, then its fierce rival, Siena, also had a great painter, Duccio. The city was immensely proud of him. And the city fathers commissioned him to paint an enormous painting, the Maestra, the Madonna in Majesty. And when it was finished, they all assembled at the studio, singing and dancing and ringing the bells to carry it to the Duomo. Duccio was older and more conventional than Giotto, but he transformed conventions. Gold leaf had traditionally been used in religious painting, but when Duccio used it, he did so to make a point, to show where the worlds of heaven and earth meet, but do not mingle. He was a Gothic artist, and for the Gothic artist, humanity took second place to the beautiful but remote world of heaven. And here it is, still in Siena, but alas, not in the spaciousness of the cathedral, and double alas, not as Duccio painted it. It was a huge work, a kind of arena chapel in miniature, with the whole story of Christ and his mother in small pictures, above and below, and at the sides and at the back. And sometime in the 18th century, some dafty decided to cut bits off so what we've got here is a picture without the frame and, and sadly mutilated, but still beautiful. It's Duccio's vision of what it is to be in heaven. No noise, no excitement, just stillness, just lost in peace. All the saints here are the saints dear to the Sienese. And if you just home in on one, you can see the wonderful spiritual beauty with which he painted them. Look at little St. Agnes at the end. Giotto would have been interested in this 14-year-old saint as a person, whether she got on with her mother and what her school marks were like and if she had bad teeth, but not Duccio. It's Agnes as a symbol of innocence with the lovely pure lines of her face and the cascades of her robes and the way she stands there, not as an individual, a specific Agnes, but as a symbol of innocence, taken up into the joy of heaven. While Giotto had the gift of bringing the characters of the Christian story down to our level, Duccio somehow manages to raise us up to theirs, Looking at Duccio is an immensely spiritual and calming experience. And one thinks, what a gentle man he must have been. But in fact, he was the most turbulent of artists, always in trouble. He wouldn't take up arms in defense of the city. He wouldn't pay his taxes. In fact, as far as Siena was concerned, he was a wouldn't. Siena needed loyal citizens. She was a new republic, no kings, no princes. Here, the elected council ruled from the people's palace, the magnificent Palazzo Publico, which is still the local town hall. Government was taken immensely seriously. The nine councillors sat in this splendid council chamber in the presence of an extraordinary painting by Ambrosio Lorenzetti with the political message to inspire or to warn. As you enter, you're confronted by bad government, tyranny rules. The walls are crumbling, no woman is safe in the streets, there's robbery, violence, terror. But on this wall, in all its splendor, is a panorama of good government. Now, Lorenzetti had a technical problem because there were two centers to this. One was justice, because the Republic was based upon every person being treated equally. 
And there she is, the great queen, even-handedly distributing justice with cords leading down to agreement, the community consensus on what was right. And these cords are held by the 24 ordinary CNEs, topped by the nine with their fur caps, which lead the eye along to the virtues that make a republic. Splendid in the middle is the great patriarchal figure of community spirit with all the other virtues to help him. Now, with a city like this, governed by justice and community spirit, what could it be but perfect? And Ambrosio knew exactly what the perfect city would look like. The perfect city, of course, was Siena. And there is its signature, the Duomo and the tower up at the top. Ambrosio painted it as the city of happiness and order, all its citizens enjoying prosperity, being at peace with themselves, flourishing. There are no clogged drains, no broken windows, no policemen, no riots, just contented buyers and sellers with their neat stalls giving on to clean, unpolluted streets where the local people could enjoy music and dancing. And when you come through this well-ordered city and pass outside the gates, you find not just a well-ordered countryside, but a recognisable countryside. Now, the Interesting thing is that if you come out of Siena today, that's very like what you see. Those steep little hills, those intensely cultivated slopes. This was the first time an artist really took his own geographical setting and saw it as full of meaning. It's an enchanting picture for us, but we've got to remember that it was in fact a supreme feat of avant-garde imagination. People were beginning to look at the world around them with fresh eyes. Hundreds were flocking to join the Franciscan brothers, who were living a life of poverty in harmony with nature. In fact, everybody was inspired by St. Francis, the little poor man of Assisi, who called the sun his sister and the wolf his brother. Now, here's a paradox that a man who felt such intense closeness to the natural world, who scorned material things and lived in absolute poverty, should have been honored on his death with this extravagant memorial. The enormous Basilica of St. Francis was decorated by all the best painters in Italy. It's almost like a Gothic who's who. The very height of Gothic elegance can be found in the work of Simone Martini. He painted the Chapel of St. Martin, an early conscientious objector, bringing together Giotto's humanity and the serenity of his teacher, Duccio. Here we've got St. Martin, the Roman soldier. And in the middle of a war, he's decided to become a Christian. And you can see the war. There were the enemy troops all massing, and there were the Roman tents. There are the soldiers getting paid. There are the war horses snorting for battle. And he comes to the emperor and says this is a, a war of aggression and he's not going to fight in it. He'll walk before the army with a cross and be killed, but he won't kill. Now, for this young man, this is a moment of supreme drama. 
and we see the effect. The emperor's angry astonishment, the man with the wonderful hat, who's rigid with contempt. And right on the end, the soldier who looks with sad disappointment at his friend. And Martin is going to walk away into that empty, barren space, that lonely decision that is symbolized in the painting. Now, how does Simone treat this? What he doesn't do is pressure us, nudge us toward an emotional reaction. He's utterly restrained. He shows something supremely beautiful, that, that color. He's one of the great colorists of the world. And he leaves us to sense for ourselves the passion underneath the beauty. And to be so reticent is to me to be a holy adult artist. A hundred years on and north to the city of Bruges to see the last great flowering of the art of the Middle Ages. The Flemish artists were rather different to the Italians. They saw the world differently. They were northerners, far more down to earth, far less idealistic. What they loved painting were the common or garden elements of their own households. You could say they invented the interior. They were helped in this rather more domestic approach to painting by the climate. They couldn't paint on damp walls, so they painted on wood. And wood was the perfect background for using oils. Oil is translucent. It catches the light. It could recreate all the gleaming detail of a wealthy home or a splendid church. And the first great master of oil painting was Jan van Eyck whose technique created a brilliant and lucid reality. This is one of those unforgettable paintings, Jan van Eyck's portrait of, and here I begin to falter, is it of the Arnolfini marriage, or of the Arnolfini betrothal, or just portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife, Giovanna? It's one of those paintings that looks so simple. But the more you look at it, the more you see how rich it is. And to me, rich is the operative word. These are two young Italians making it in wealthy Bruges. And they want to show that they're making it. Everything here is a status symbol. And we can so easily misread it. We look at that bed. And we say, ha-ha, no, no, this isn't the bedroom. This is the reception room, because a bed like that was considered a wonderful piece of furniture, and you wanted to display it, not to use it. And Giovanna's dress, again, we think we know she's pregnant. Not at all. That's the very latest fashion, with a swelling stomach, a hideous fashion, but still the very latest cascading down to show how very rich she is. Is the little dog there as a symbol of marital fidelity? Or because it's the thing to have an expensive little pet dog of no functional value to the household? And the oranges, those costly fruit, everything here can be read many ways. There's that mirror. And you can see figures reflected in it, one of which must be the artist. And above it is written, Jan van Eyck was here. And I always think this is a, a witticism, because never was there a painting when it was not obvious that the painter was there. 
His eye has made the painting. What you're seeing is what that scalpel sharp eye of the Nike saw. All the Nike's paintings are about looking, about reporting. Even when he paints the man who held the purse strings for one of the most powerful dynasties in Europe, Chancellor Roland, a man who could make or break any artist, the Nike is always detached. And for us looking on, this detachment may even have a touch of irony. Before you get lost in the beauty of this painting, we should perhaps notice its title, The Virgin of Chancellor Roland. What is Van Eyck getting at? Is this painted in honor of the Virgin or in honor of Chancellor Roland himself? Chancellor Roland was notorious for taxing the poor. But as he entered his twilight years, he began to worry about the health of his soul. And to ease his conscience, he built a hospital for the sick poor. In the Middle Ages, people came to hospital not to be cured, but to die. The nuns who cared for them only knew how to prepare their patients for the next world. As the incurable lay here, three or four to a bed, racked with pain and disease, they could look to the altar at the end of this room where Roland had placed a glorious encouragement for them. This is the great last judgment that van der Weyden painted for the sick in hospital here. And first of all, with wonderful clarity, he shows us what the last judgment will be. Angels trumpeting to rouse the dead, Christ there and his majesty as judge, and St. Michael weighing the dead to see whose selfishness is so great that it will drag him downwards. Now you can see that van der Weyden is as great an artist as van Eyck. Look at that cloak that St. Michael is wearing, the, the gleam and, and the, the realism of it. But he had one gift that Van Eyck didn't have. He had an extraordinary power to express emotion. Look at the anxious concern on the faces of his saints. Here are none of the stern looks we normally find in Last Judgments. We sense anticipation in the eyes of the dead rising from the earth. Will they follow the grateful blessed, being received by an angel into heaven? Or will their consciences be so burdened that they will be drawn down to join the damned? Now here, Van der Weyden does something special. In place of the usual Gothic images of the damned being snatched away by triumphant devils, he shows them taking themselves to the fire or dragging each other down guilt feelings, they condemn themselves, and there's not a devil in sight. While the people of the Middle Ages were desperately concerned about the worlds to come, they were equally fearful of the present. There was so little in their lives that they could understand or control and this terrible uncertainty made them vulnerable to superstition. Their minds were possessed by the image of the world as a battlefield between good and evil, as we see it in the medieval mystery plays. Yet, fear can drive the imagination. Take Hieronymus Bosch. His demons come from the darkest extremes of the Gothic vision. They embody the moral anguish of the Gothic mind and all its secret terrors. In The Temptation of St. Anthony, 
the saint is tormented by demons. It looks like science fiction, but it's not. It's a complex code. Bosch's attempt to give a prophetic warning. In a small painting like this Ship of Fools, I think we can see more clearly how deeply serious an artist Bosch was. A magical artist, I mean, it's full of humour, but its message is a profound one. It's that old metaphor of life as a voyage. And what does Bosch see us doing on the voyage? Wasting time, eating and drinking and fooling around, quite oblivious of where our ship is going, drifting. It's not that they're irreligious people. After all, these two in the front are monk and nun. And although she's playing the lute and their cherries here, symbols of love, you really cannot look at those aged, emaciated figures and think there's any question of sexuality going on there. They're just time wasters. And that's what Bosch thinks is wrong. He wants to paint a picture that makes it clear that in the Gothic mind, man is evil, ugly, prone to drift, and needs teaching. Nature beautiful, with all that glittering dew. Man not. So he paints the ship of fools. Bosch himself never sailed on the tide of world history. He never moved from his provincial birthplace, the town of Den Bosch, from which he took his name. While new ideas were shaking the foundations of medieval thought, Bosch, however bizarre and extraordinary and original his images, clung to what he knew. This was the medieval cathedral where Bosch worshipped all his life. He was the last great artist who instinctively saw the world in Gothic terms, a world of gargoyles and devils and humankind under threat. So Gothic art went out with Bosch like a gigantic firework exploding in the dark sky. In our next programme, we move into a new world, the age of Leonardo, Michelangelo, and the splendours of the Italian Renaissance.